I interviewed more than 100 people this year, but I didn't hire any of them. And I'm not even the worst one. A couple of months ago, I talked to the owner of a small data consultancy and we were talking about the current market and what clients are looking for nowadays. As we were talking, he casually dropped a small brag that last year they interviewed over 1200 candidates and only hired 29 of them. 1,200 candidates, out of which, during the course of a whole year, they only hired 29. His reasoning was that they only hired the best of the best. And this is a small consultancy that, to be fair, is not doing anything innovative, just placing butts in seats. But they only want to hire the best of the best. I'm not sure that this is a good thing to brag about because it actually shows that you don't know what you're looking for. I can easily generalize this. Many companies are interviewing candidates without having clear needs and they are just sport fishing, hoping to catch mermaids. This guy wasn't just a hiring manager, he was the owner of the company, meaning that he makes the decision. Because many hiring managers don't have the last word when it comes to hiring, but the owners, the CEOs and the managing directors do. And if they're sport fishing and just interviewing for the sake of looking like they're growing their company, imagine at the lower levels where you get hiring managers that don't get this strategy and they just think, right? They just think that they might have an available role. To give you some context around how I came about to interview so many people, I'm a solutions architect and a consultant. I'm a Databricks champion and due to having more than 17 years of experience in tech, I've worn many hats during these years. And due to this experience, I've been in a position to assess candidates across multiple specializations and I can say that I have a somewhat clear understanding of the current market. Let's cut it straight to the point. The main reason why you're not getting hired, and this is just the first reason, but the main reason. The main reason is a little thing called compensation expectation misalignment. This happens when a candidate's salary expectations are misunderstood or they don't align with the company's salary structure. There are plenty of candidates, but there are also a lot of jobs. So in theory, we should be fine, but realistically, the expectations misalign on both fronts. Candidates want to be paid well, like they see in these YouTube videos that tell them they can make 300K or 600K in big tech. They see these people on social media bragging about how much they earn and how stupid people must be for accepting lower offers or for not making enough money. And on the other hand, companies saw that they can just lay off thousands of people and then still manage to run their businesses by just overworking their existing employees. And further down the chain, consultancies have to reduce the salaries that they offer to graduates and consultants because their clients don't want to offer that much in the first place. Consultancies hope to maintain their margins as well. They might even cut their margins just to keep business, but still the compensation expectations have a huge spread between employers and employees. That's why companies interview 100 people and don't hire any of them. Compensation expectation misalignment. Because there's this new generation that doesn't want to work anymore. They don't want to put in the work with the hope of a quote unquote career, right? They don't care about that, right? They just want the lifestyle. After this one, definitely check out my video on this because I talk about all the reasons why people don't want to work anymore. Another reason why companies interview so many people and don't hire them is because there are too many cooks in the kitchen. The hiring process started to involve way too many people. You get random people from the company that are interviewing for technical roles, but they actually interview from a business perspective. So you don't really just get the technical interview and then a business interview with the higher ups and then just get rejected or hired. No, you get a lot of middlemen from product or from some departments that work with that business area and they all need to chime in to say whether you're good enough to work with them. See how many people are giving you advice on top interview tips on LinkedIn. There's a never ending supply of BS content content on LinkedIn on this topic. Everybody's like an interview specialist telling you some random advice that worked, I don't know, maybe like 10 years ago. Most of them actually including themselves in the interview process without being needed in the first place. They had nothing else to do and they just decided to chase some clout by injecting themselves in the hiring process. And many of these people have no idea what's important when assessing a technical role and they just try to contribute with whatever they think that is important. And those things guys, those things most of the time, they're completely irrelevant or have been already covered earlier in the process. There's no need for a fifth interview with Susan, the head of product, because everybody else left the company and she managed to get promoted to actually assess you on some random questions that she just generated with ChatGPT. Imagine all those people will have some expectations that you might know some things that are not important at the beginning because that's their job, right? It's not yours. You're gonna have enough time to understand the landscape if you would get the job but they will reject you if they feel that you weren't really interested or you weren't really a team player or they just didn't like you. Which brings me to the next reason why you're not getting hired and that's likability. 
Quick pause. If you're looking for a cloud engineering job, getting cloud certified is a great way to show to employers that you're familiar with cloud services. At getthatbadge.com, we offer practice exams to help you prepare for cloud certification exams. Check it out because this way you can at the same time support this channel and improve yourself by learning a new skill. Likeability is a huge thing nowadays because many people think that they just need to hire people that they would love to have a drink with after hours. Mate, after hours I want to hang out with my friends and family. Not with somebody that in a corporate environment would stab me in the back if they needed to in order to get a promotion. I mean, look at this guy. As someone who also hired hundreds of people over my career, I will never forget the advice my boss gave to me when I first became a manager. Ask yourself, would you enjoy sitting next to this person on an LA to NYC flight? Mate, it doesn't matter. You hire somebody to do a job, to be accountable and to get the job done. Not to have a drink with your sorry ass or go on a flight with you. People that are software engineers, they aren't always likable. Especially people that are good engineers. And certainly they don't want to have a drink with you. Let me explain. When you try to solve a technical problem and you're actually deep in your mind trying to sort it out. Nobody's going to be likable if some random guy just walks up to you to chat you up about your favorite Taylor Swift song. Again, there needs to be a level of collaboration and niceness and decency, but not to be best friends with a guy. From my personal experience, everybody's looking out for themselves. So as soon as they will need to, they're going to throw you under the bus. The more layers and interview rounds that you have, the higher the chances that one person won't like you and that person will actually ruin the whole process. The reality guys, the objective reality is that we are not likable to every human being. Some of you like me and share my views on this topic and some of you don't and that's fine because if you do, like and share this video so that more people get to see it. But if you don't, I still appreciate you for watching this long. The reality is that we cannot be likable all the time by everybody. Unless you're a minion, because if you're a minion, everybody's gonna like you. In order for all people to like you, you need to remove all of your individual personality and just become bland and completely empty so that you cannot offend anybody with your opinions. Look at this one. Most hiring managers only want to hire extremely basic conformists with zero personality. The only way to get a job is to look like a Brooks Brothers commercial and have an extremely vapid personality to match. See Patrick Bateman. I'd love to disagree with this one, but it's 100% correct. Because people say that they expect grit, integrity, empathy and creativity from a person. No, they don't. They expect to find people that match their way of thinking and people that would not be a threat to them in their current role. And if you just diverge a bit in one area, you're no good. And the chances that this will happen if you interview with five or more people from various departments, the chances are pretty high. And this is how corporate environments are and any company that grows past a certain level is going to have this type of dynamics. See this, tons of people are nice, but that doesn't mean that they get the job done. I'd rather deal with a pain in the ass, but respect their work ethic, IQ, experience, etc. I once worked with a guy that was very difficult to deal with. He didn't really care about anything but getting the work done. And he wanted to get that work done as he thought it needed to be done. It was very difficult to engage with him because many of my coworkers actually were scared to talk to him because he was very quick to dismiss them if they talked any nonsense. But the guy was great at his job and carried two or three people on his shoulders. The job was always done and the deliverables were on time. And at the same time, I also worked with a political guy that just kept raising issues and trying to organize everything into a Kanban board and try to boss people around to actually do his work for him. Or just wanted to do some strategy meetings with the bosses. And this was a completely useless individual and he just burned everybody's time. This guy, the management loved. Mind you, this was a startup because in a corporate environment, the difficult guy to work with would have been definitely laid off and the other one would have been promoted. Here's the process for mostly everybody that says that they're interviewers, including myself. I have no control over the filtering process. I just get sent candidates chosen for interviews. These are all contractor positions, so a third party gets the money, then pays them whatever. This can be for both contractors and perm. The contractors can have it a little bit more straightforward because these positions should have clear objectives. They're hired for a pretty fine period in which they have to deliver X and that should make the process better and with less interview rounds. But for Perm, you can have 100 interviews and literally hire no one. I work for a large enough company where we have internal HR and recruiting. We use contractors sometimes and do direct hires. Contractor hiring requires a single phone screen before the offer. But the hiring process for internal candidates is also very expensive compared to contractor hiring. Internals require recruiter screen, tech screen and two, three general screens 
followed by standardized meetings regarding scoring the general script. A lot of the scoring is actually done through Greenhouse, so I'm not sure that there is really need to score them in a separate meeting. You can easily do that in general purpose meetings in which you can just decide who gets hired. We are hiring for senior positions and just practically everybody that we interview can barely code. Our tests are very simple too. This depends a lot on the recruiter and what they actually send your way because I've had situations like this in which out of 10 candidates, I couldn't pass any of them. So you have to switch recruiters so that they can do a better screening. Otherwise you just burn a lot of time and then you just get disillusioned with the quality of the candidates. Once I switched recruiters to a better one and gave them clear guidelines to actually assess these candidates, then out of 10 candidates, I could pass six, which is a huge improvement by just getting a recruiter to do their job. I think our supplier is trying to screw us. They suspiciously make every resume look almost the same. I wonder if they're just finding desperate people who will work for pennies, beefed up their resume to make them look like they're senior, and then just stand dozens our way until we end up picking the one that can at least kind of code. This can be true depending on how you work with recruiters, because if you have an exclusive deal with them, then this might certainly be the case. Then they have it secured, they don't really have any competition that can send you better candidates. So by lowering your expectations, they can work on their margins. Because if you get a cheap candidate, their margins are gonna be higher, so their incentive is actually skewed and is not in your favor. But the better recruiters actually care and they try to do what's best. I actually know quite a few recruiters that are great, so you can definitely find good ones. Now, every recruiter is gonna try to beef up your resume. You are also trying to beef it up. Everybody tries to optimize their CVs to the point that they might even include white lies. It's very tough to assess someone now by just reading their CV because everybody looks like they were just crucial to the success of their latest project, but many of them, many of them were just coasting along trying to just look good to the bosses. But when you read those CVs, you actually think that you're about to hire the next Linus Torvalds. Nowadays, a lot of resumes are custom designed to hit as many search terms as possible. So everyone just throws in all the trending terms. All of them look like they're perfect for the job because they rewrote those to match the exact requirements and still keep it relatively close to their capabilities. But that closeness is relative depending on how much they're willing to lie on their CVs. And I noticed the pattern here as well, but I'm gonna keep that for another video because that's a long discussion as well. We started having candidates where every resume has every skill listed, like 13, 14 programming languages. No explanation of their previous projects, just project name and the whole list of terms like Scrum, CICD, Big Data, SQL, but no explanation of the project. I notice this a lot in my interviews because this is very true, especially with somebody that has the mentality to just try and see if it sticks. I understand that people just want to get in, but at the same time, there are going to be obvious issues when you get to a technical round and you don't even need to give them a test or anything. A simple 10 minute conversation will definitely clear them out because many of them will rely on ambiguity and pretending like they don't understand, trying to get you to help them to figure out the solution. Sometimes the language barrier can also be an issue because many so-called developers, they hide behind it because you will just assume that it's just a language understanding issue. But in fact, they're just parallel to the topic. When you listen to them, if you let them talk, you're gonna easily see that they're clueless. And the coding test, they might even pass a coding test if it's simple enough, but a discussion that needs to make sense, that's a lot harder for them. I believe this works, I mean this ambiguity and this deflection, because I noticed that some other interviewers that aren't technical, they were amazed by candidates just because they said certain buzzwords like data governance and AI safety and so on. I think many people are just so naive that if they hear a buzzword, it's like the person that said it is a specialist. I think this is the LinkedIn specialist effect, but it certainly works and some of them managed to break into roles just because somebody liked them and believed their fake credentials. But later you find that they're not suitable for that role and they just put pressure on the team to carry their weight. This guy here was trusting the resumes were accurate and hadn't really figured out the questions to ask if they actually knew what they were doing and could think critically. Well, now you know. Most of them are exaggerations, so the vetting from the recruiter side needs to be better, but that can be biased if they're external recruiters. The best thing would be to have internal recruiters, but that opens up other issues, like political and DI issues that, again, require their own discussion in a separate video. Just to make it clear for all of you guys that stayed with me so far, I would never interview so many candidates and not hire. 
Unfortunately, when it's not your decision, you can pass a subset of them from a technical perspective, okay? But at the end, the end decision is made by the management. And people that are interviewing candidates, whenever they're external recruiters or employees, they aren't exposed to management's decision many times, you know? So they just hope for the best, just as candidates do. Also, many times what happens is that the process is so slow that some departments just want to get into the interview process and add new interview rounds, you know, for no reason. And as you get more external recruiters that send you, I don't know, like taxi drivers instead of engineers, then you can easily have a hundred interviews and hire none of them. No offense to taxi drivers, you can be an engineer too. If you liked what you heard, please like, share and subscribe. And if you didn't like it, thank you for listening this long and I will see you in the next one.